So we've already talked about the uh, Cold War during the 1950s a little bit, but this next lecture focuses almost exclusively on the Cold War. Alarm in New York. Atomic war threats. It is still only an experiment, but people assume the worst. Subways are transformed into bunkers. Within two minutes of the alarm, Times Square was empty. It looked as though World War III was looming over us. So there was, a, there was among many people a desperate feeling that this has got to be prevented. This explosion created panic in the West. Four years after the Second World War ended, the Soviet Union also has the atomic bomb. This is the beginning of atomic armament. In Los Alamos, home of the atom bomb, new plans were born to create an even more effective weapon, the hydrogen bomb. Ich war der Überzeugung, dass was gemacht werden kann. I was convinced if something is possible, then somebody will do it. The question is just that. Who would do it? For me, it was better if it was built in the USA. In the United States, it was built. The Aniwetok Atoll, 6,000 kilometers from the Californian beaches and very far away from the affairs of the Cold War. At that time, we all lived together. My parents, my grandparents. We were never hungry. We had everything, and we lived in harmony. But the days of happiness were numbered. Expulsion from paradise, with a smile for the cameras. American soldiers disembark suspecting nothing. We knew nothing more about radiation than we knew about the sun shining. And we were told, you'll be protected, you'll have no problems, uh, do, what we, do what we say, and we were young enough and dumb enough to do that. The Americans took Mike as well, the code name of the bomb. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The final countdown begins. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That was one of the most impressive moments in my life. I mean, I remember vividly that, yes, that's it. I mean, that's how you do it. And I felt as though there had been another, you know, history had taken another small, sudden turn. The bomb made history. It was as if 10 million tons of TNT had exploded at the same time, like Hiroshima multiplied by 750. In the race of insanity, the Americans are the first again the Pacific Ocean paradise is transformed into hell on Earth. Elugalap disappears from the map. The experiment is a success. All test items seem to be swept clean. Ugilab is completely gone. Nothing there but water. And what appears to be a deep I have sofort telegraphed. I telegraphed urgently to Los Alamos although it usually wasn't permitted. The hydrogen bomb worked, but it was a secret. The whole text of the telegraph was, it's a boy. The other father had scruples. If there's another world war, the civilization may go under. We need to ask ourselves whether we're doing everything we can to avert that. This was spoken by the father of the atomic bomb. Inhabitants of the Pacific Ocean Atoll were the victims of the game played by world powers. Oh, well, an army roll. 
We felt helpless. We didn't have any equipment nor power to stop it. Uncontrollable. Final countdown for the second bomb. Its name is Bravo. The sun was coming up in the west, is what it, what it appeared like. Only it, was, it came up as, as a flash rather than a gradual sunrise as, that comes on gradually. This came on like a flashbulb. Poof. 1,000 times Hiroshima. The explosion is even stronger than expected. The mushroom of the bomb is 15 kilometers high. It was a huge explosion. When we heard it, we were convinced that it had destroyed the whole Rongilap Island. After the explosion, a gritty white ash begins to fall. The Japanese Lucky Dragon fishing boat's crew floated into the radioactive cloud. 23 fishermen are aboard. One of them dies. They felt that the, the cause of maintaining peace at the highest level was, uh, was uh, the, the important question, and that uh, some accidents uh, in the process of doing that were inevitable even though unfortunate. Unfortunately, an unfavorable wind spread the radioactive ashes towards Rongelop Island. The Americans had assumed this. Now they examine the consequences. It is not yet possible to calculate the total amount of destruction. My first child was born without a backbone. He was absolutely soft. He was stillborn. In the years after Bravo, the first victims die of thyroid cancer. Most of the children living on the island suffer from malignant tumors. For them, Bravo meant beaming victory. That was then. Nowadays, they belong to the victims as well. We're guinea pigs over here. If you do not come down with some serious illness within the first 40 years after we've experienced this, you've got it made. I didn't make 40 years. I came down with cancer. This explosion was supposed to ensure peace, but on the contrary, it destroyed the peace of the surrounding area. We were so happy when we could still live together as a whole family. Now, our family is all spread out because of these terrible, horrible things which happened to us. You should know by now that the Cold War is really a almost a 24-7 uh, competition between uh, the West, headed by the United States, what was known as the First World, and the Second World, which was the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc sta uh, states that were uh, aligned with it. And it really was, uh, when I say it was a competition, I mean it was a literal competition, everything. Everything was geared to beating the Russians. And, and I love this cartoon from uh, the mid-1950s, about, right about the time I was born, uh, where a, a dad's chewing his kid out because a C in math? How do you expect to beat the Russians with a C in math? October 4th, 1957. The Soviet Union made news around the world with its successful launch of Sputnik, the world's first satellite. Only a month later, they did it again with the launch of Sputnik 2. And the space age had begun. Two things are astonishing about Sputnik the second. Its weight, more than half a ton, and its live passenger, a dog. Our artist shows how this flying dog kennel is probably arranged. Radio, food and oxygen supplies, and Leica, the most famous husky in the world, or strictly speaking, out of it. 
Without knowing it, Mica is telling man whether, in the years to come, it will be safe for him to follow her. Meanwhile, he watches her progress with envious eyes, wondering to what adventures this little pioneer is blazing the trail. Russia ultimately launched 10 Sputnik satellites to collect data in space. Using a variety of animals, scientists tested life support systems and re-entry procedures. These missions left little doubt that the Soviets were shooting for the moon. A short film they produced clearly demonstrated their intentions. The rocket races forward along an orbit that has been calculated in its up. A command from the Earth, and it launches out another orbit. Pathé News originally presented this animated film exactly as received from Moscow. Distributed in English, the film demonstrated to Western audiences how serious the Russians were about going to the moon. Now it's already in the zone of the moon's gravity. A radio signal from the Earth, and the rocket turns its tail towards the moon. The engine now slows up the speed of descent. A laboratory on tank threads cruises along the surface of the moon. It shoots up an antenna. And a television transmitter goes into operation. Propaganda? Wishful thinking? Sober prophecy? We'll have to wait and see. But the United States didn't have a wait and see attitude on that matter. The space race was on and the U.S. was behind. At Cape Canaveral, Florida, a Vanguard rocket is ready to launch America's first Sputnik into space. But rockets are unpredictable things, and our slow motion camera records how an undetected fault in the first stage of the rocket turned the launching into calamity. Not fatal, but disappointing. At first, the American public are dismayed at the accident. But they soon realize that the setback is only temporary. And after all, who knows how many failures the Russians had before their Sputniks were launched. On February 1st, 1958, the United States successfully launched Explorer 1, America's first satellite to orbit the Earth. The space race was on, sparked by the groundbreaking Soviet launch of Sputnik on October 4th, 1957. So to try to get a handle on it, again, as I said before, the, the, the terms first world, second world, and third world actually are invented at this time. And they're not, you know, often you hear people say, oh, they're like a third world country, meaning that they are a poor country. Uh, that's not the original definition of these terms. The first world literally was the United States and their allies. So the United States and Western Europe were the first world. The second world was the Soviet Union and what we refer to as the Warsaw Powers. You've already heard, we've already talked a little bit about the Warsaw Pact. So you have NATO on one side, which we're the, the dominant uh, member of, and um, the Soviet Union has the Warsaw Pact on the other side. And we set ourselves up in a somewhat defensively offensive position by um, spreading ourselves around the world to try to contain uh, both Soviet in Europe and Chinese in Asia, uh, expansion. This is our, our, our attempt to kind of keep the, the uh, international uh, uh, plague of communism from spreading around the world, was to try to contain it. And Winston Churchill gives a speech, uh, this is after he's out of office, and, and, but he's still a very popular figure, even though he's not winning elections. Um, and, he, and he basically says that an iron curtain has descended uh, uh, between the East and the West. And that's where we get the, the, uh, the, the term, um, the iron curtain. November 1st, 1952, the United States exploded the first hydrogen bomb. Aboard a Navy ship steaming toward Eniwetok Atoll in November 1952, a handful of men share a secret which can shape the fate of the world. On a tiny island named Ilujalab, the Atomic Energy Commission and the Defense Department are preparing to explode the world's most fearsome weapon, the first hydrogen bomb. The bomb, which was nicknamed Mike, was under the observation of the four groups performing the test. The Army, Navy, Air Force, and the scientific contingent. 
A weather briefing is held as each hour nears, for weather conditions can make or break the test shot. Any chance of showers? Not within the next 48 hours or with the entire marshals. How about cloud cover? If you cumulus move in, but if we go off on schedule, there's nothing to bother the operation. In less than a minute, the first hydrogen bomb ever set off on Earth will explode before your very eyes. Minus 15 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, -er. the shockwave as it rolls toward the flagship. This film was edited to exclude any classified information and was released two years after the bomb was exploded. Helicopters whirling away to study the test island must get in and out quickly. Radioactive dust will begin showering the atoll in an hour. From the helicopters, observers could clearly see that the island was completely flattened. There was nothing left except what seemed to be a deep crater and the dark blue water. The bomb produced a fireball more than three miles across. Compared to New York skyline, this meant that with the Empire State Building as the zero point, the fireball would extend from Washington Square to Central Park, searing one quarter of the island of Manhattan in an instant. The tremendous upsurge of air from the detonation rapidly pushes up the Mike Cloud. Again, nothing of this height and width has ever before been witnessed. If the picture is stopped at this point in the cloud's growth, the height of the cloud is approximately 40,000 feet. This means that 32 Empire State Buildings at 1,250 feet each could be piled one on top of the other before they would reach the cloud's altitude at this time, roughly two minutes after zero. Some 10 minutes later, the cloud approaches its maximum. The mushroom portion of the deadly radioactive air mass has pushed up to around 10 miles and spreads out along the base of the stratosphere to the width of about 100 miles. The stem itself is snaking upward to a height of about 25 miles. The bomb, which created a crater approximately a mile in diameter, was hundreds of times more destructive than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Everything within a radius of three miles was completely annihilated. Severe to moderate damage was recorded out to seven miles. The lateral destructive effects were the greatest achieved by a single explosive device. Light damage extended as far as 10 miles. With this mushroom cloud, mankind enters the hydrogen bomb age, an era in which every one of us must share the fateful decision to create or destroy. The hydrogen bomb's awesome power to destroy truly shook the world on November 1st, 1952. Paranoia ran so deep, the fear of the bomb that, um, you know, we've already talked about the, the video duck and cover, um, but we, especially Americans, but it was, it was the case in Europe as well, and Europe had lived through the bombing. America has not seen any violence on our shores other than 9-11 since the Civil War. Uh, we've never, uh, we haven't fought a foreign adversary on our soil uh, basically since the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, back before we were even a country. Um, uh, fighting against England was, of course, fighting against our own country. That was a, a civil war, and then our own civil war. We've never had enemy combatants on U.S. soil. And so the paranoia is co quite different than it is in areas where they are kind of used to things like that. So uh, the paranoia runs very, very deep. And I love this picture because it shows exactly everything that is wrong with the uh, mentality of American people when they prepare for emergencies, right? Uh, and we, we, we saw this with the COVID-19 uh, emergency a while back. Um, that we usually prepare too late and too little. Um, earlier, uh, well, we won't go into that right now. Uh, so I'm looking at this photograph. I love this photograph because it really illustrates the bullshit. And that is, number one, 
Uh, this is a small metal container buried under the ground. Um, it's got some air filtration of some sort. I don't know how that actually works in some of these. But basically, you're in a canister underground, no windows. How long are you going to stay there? Nuclear, nuclear winter can last 100 years. Are you going to hang out in this with your wife and your daughter until they both just die or you die or whatever? I mean, what what is the purpose of this so-called uh, shelter? Um, you've got one box of canned food, one box of canned water. you got a friggin' air mattress. Anybody that's ever gone camping knows that those things will be flat the first day uh, that that anybody tries to sleep on them. So I mean, this is the, and, and and here they are li trying to listen to their their radio, not even a portable radio. They got it plugged into the mains. Like this thing is running off of electricity that is running through the regular system, which means that in, in the case of a of nuclear annihilation, they won't have light, they won't have radio, they won't have. I mean, what everything with this picture is wrong. Now, a couple of, of, of events that happen that I think are, are important. Number one is the Marshall Plan. After World War II, we went to Europe, and we essentially rebuilt um, Europe and Japan. We, uh, they were so devastated from American bombing, from British bombing, from, uh, uh, from uh, German attacks, from Japanese attacks, that essentially the, the, those, those areas needed to be built, rebuilt from scratch. And we were willing to spend the money, billions of dollars that we spent, to rebuild Europe to make it a peaceful place. I mean, e Europe was so used to fighting each other that when they had a war that lasted 131 years, they stopped counting at 100. Uh, the 100 years war lasts almost, you know, it does last 130 years, but they don't even bother because they're so used to fighting amongst themselves. And so when you get to the end of World War II, the idea is we're done. We're not going to do this again, which of course will ultimately end in the EU. But, um, so we rebuild their countries, we rebuild their manufacturing capabilities, we rebuild their cities, we also rebuild their, um, their, po their politics. We have a lot of input into the constitutions of Italy and France and Germany and and uh, Japan, and we're able to put into these uh, uh, constitutions massive protections for the individual, for workers, for uh, protections for unions, protections for women. Women are equal in Japan, a, a very uh, what we would consider to be a misogynistic. Uh, society, a male-dominated society that still has geishas as a, as a, a uh, uh, regular feature of, of, of uh, Japanese life. But legally, in their system, men and women have exactly the same rights. They have to get the same pay for the same job. They are essentially equal. Um, and we do this throughout. Germany, you have to have 50% uh, of, uh, of any corporate board of, of directors must come from the unions that are represented within that company. So we, we really do build a brand new Europe, and, and unfortunately, uh, and a new Japan. Unfortunately, though, uh, by the time we get to the 1970s, their manufacturing capabilities far exceed ours, their technology exceeds ours, and they really start giving us a, a, a massive run for our money because we're, we're still dealing with uh, factories that were from before the war, and we don't have the same worker protections, the same uh, gender and, and uh, ethnic protections that we insisted that other countries have. The, the, the second Bill of Rights, the individual Bill of Rights, the four freedoms, those got into the countries we rebuilt. They didn't get implemented here. Now, Germany is a weird place in that um, Berlin is on the eastern, in the eastern half of Germany. And when, at the end of World War II, the Allied forces, French, German, France, England, the United States, and Russia, divided Berlin into four sectors. And each of those Allied countries controlled one sector of Berlin. After a while after the war, the, the three um, 
European and the Amer the two Amer European and American countries um, combined their zones, and it was pretty much part of the West. But it's in the East, and the Soviet Union is expanding and really absorbing, basically annexing ma major parts of Eastern Europe, including half of Germany. And when they do that, we retain, the West retains, that portion of Berlin that was under the U.S., French, and German control. The Soviets control the other half. And so the Berlin Wall is, divides the city because East Germans were going to West Germany, uh, West Germany. East German was poor. It was uh, under the, the Soviets. It was in transition. It was rebuilding. It didn't have the benefit of the, of the Marshall Plan, whereas the, west, uh, the East side did. I mean, the West side did. The, and so the West is, is at the same level as the rest of Germany, which is miles and miles away. There's a, you know, a road that links uh, West Berlin with West Germany, but West Berlin is actually in East Germany. And so uh, the Soviets want to try to cut off Berlin. And so they basically cut off the roads and are not able to get any supplies in. And so it's, it's basically, um, you know, everybody's sheltered in place and they're not able to get food. They're not able to get other necessary uh, supplies and, and, and goods in. And with the idea being that they would, would choke off that part and then they would be willing to go into the, the Soviet side and that would divide Germany in half, but they would have the rest of Berlin. Uh, Kennedy doesn't let, allow that to happen. He actually sets up an, uh, an airlift, works with our allies in the West, and we begin to uh, drop crates with parachutes on them full of food and medicine and other supplies, and we just literally drop it into uh, 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 West Berlin. Uh, this will break up the blockade. It will uh, essentially cause the process that, that, the, the, that the Soviet Union is, is doing, trying to to cut this off, uh, it, it defeats it, and, 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 and West Berlin will stay in the West until the, the wall falls. Um, once the Soviets have perfected their bomb, and, and it's really, it, it isn't that big a deal for them to do so, because all along, the, actually the secretary for some of the, the top uh, f actually for Oppenheimer, the, the guy who ran the Manhattan Project, his secretary was a Soviet spy. And every night she would go in after everyone else had gone home, open the safe, because she was one of the three people that had this uh, combination of the safe, photograph all the documents that were in there, all of the plans, all of the test results, all of the stuff that they had, whatever they had. She would photograph it and then ship it to the Soviet Union. So by the time our bomb was, our, our first bombs were being tested, they already had all of the data and all of the, basically, the how I did it instructions. Uh, and so within two years of uh, us uh, firing off the very first test missile, uh, the Soviets have it. And this really accentuates and accelerates uh, the Cold War. November 4, 1956, at dawn, a thousand Soviet tanks rolled into the center of Budapest to put down a revolt which had brought hope, freedom, and a new style of government to the people of Hungary. The rise against Soviet rule had begun some weeks earlier. This is how it all started, with a peaceful students' demonstration 100,000 strong. They carried pro-communist banners. No one spoke of rebellion. All they asked was greater democracy within the present regime. But meanwhile on the radio, party secretary Gero was describing the demonstrators as rabble. And the word was like a burning match in a powder barrel. All the pent-up emotions of a decade, all the hatred of Russian interference flared up at once. Budapest became a battleground. For the first time since the communist takeover at the end of World War II, the Hungarian national flag was openly displayed, and the hated red flags were burned. Partisans were joined by elements of the Hungarian army, and when they weren't fighting alongside, 
the soldiers often handed over their weapons to the revolutionaries, including their tanks. What started as a small anti-Soviet protest erupted into a full-fledged war. While some hardline members of the Hungarian Politburo wanted the Soviets to help put down the rebellion, others advocated compromise. There were now hundreds of thousands of people marching through the streets of Budapest. At first, Premier Imre Naj seemed to support the revolution, but soon he was directing the secret police against his former supporters. Even as Russian officials were publicly negotiating the withdrawal of Soviet troops from Budapest, plans for a full-scale attack on the rebels were being drawn up in Moscow. The velvet glove was about to be removed from the iron fist. The brutality of that fateful day not only helped bring dissident Hungarians to heel, it also brought condemnation from around the world and censure from the United Nations. After eight weeks of valiant resistance, Hungary's patriots were faced with the inevitability of Soviet might. Over 50,000 were killed in the fighting. Premier Naj was executed for having initially voiced sympathy for the revolutionary's cause. Despite the brutal crushing of the revolution, the people of Hungary would not give up. It would take 30 more years, but they would finally gain their freedom. As I mentioned before, we set up NATO, uh, which uh, includes all of the, uh, basically all of the, the Western nations, uh, as far as Turkey, uh, and uh, the Soviet unions do the same. Uh, they set up a, a uh, uh, what's called the Warsaw Pact, and although the UN includes all of the nations of the of the world, uh, these two military alliances essentially echo the end of World War II. It's the West again, well not even that. It's, it's, the, it's the Cold War but an armed Cold War because you have the Western alliance on one side and then you have the Soviets uh, on the other and their um, satellite states which they lost in the 90s, many of them, uh, but they've been gradually reinvading Georgia and, and Crimea and all that stuff has been going on uh, ever since. So uh, they're, they're trying to rebuild it. That's part of their, their whole reason for trying to destabilize the West with election interfering and propaganda and all kinds of other stuff. So uh, the, the Cold War ended because the Soviet Union ended, but Russia has never really been a good friend to the United States except in World War I and World War II where Russia then Russia, not the Soviet Union. In World War II, the Soviet Union, yes, but where Russia and, and the United States have, have been allies in the major wars, but outside of the wars, we have been uh, on the gentle side, competitors, and on the, the harsher side, uh, bitter enemies, but never a hot war between the two of us. Many years ago, a curtain was drawn, and no, I'm not talking about Broadway, but one that divided the world in two. Today, we're talking about the most famous curtain in the world, the Iron Curtain. Welcome to another episode of It's History. I'm Indy. Let's take a look at this ominous Iron Curtain and how it emerged. During the Cold War, the Iron Curtain distinguished East from West. It's really a metaphor for the blocs. There's the West, led by the United States, and the East, led by the Soviet Union. The term not only describes physical borders between the two, but also the ideological separation. Winston Churchill coined the term while on a lecturing tour through America. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended on Europe. When all is said and done, the Iron Curtain hung for over 40 years, but it was most apparent in Germany. But how exactly had this division come about, and what role did the individual nations play? We're led once again to the end of the Second World War. It is decided at the 1945 conferences of Yalta and Potsdam that Germany is to be divided into four zones to prevent it from regaining power or starting another war. But even at the Yalta conference, Britain and the USA had begun to prefer a stable and strong Germany. Why this sudden change of heart? Two words, Joseph Stalin. A stronger Germany would be a buffer against Russia. So democracy meets 
dictatorship. In addition, economic and financial policy led to further points of contention. In July 1944, the United States invited 44 countries to an international conference in Bretton Woods. Here, the economic, post-war future of the world was to be decided, and two organizations were established, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. This new economic system based its reserve currency on gold and the U.S. dollar, which gave the U.S. enormous political and economic power. America has more than two-thirds of the world's gold reserves, so American control of the World Bank and the IMF can effectively isolate communist states. Stalin also contributed to this isolation, though. He refused to sign the agreement. Germany was to pay off its war debts. On this fact, everyone agreed, but there was no consensus about how and when exactly this should happen. The Soviet Union wanted the money as quickly as possible. The Western powers, however, preferred to wait until Germany's economy was somewhat back on its feet. So France, the United States, Great Britain, and Russia planned to split up Germany into sectors controlled by each nation and deal with reparations separately, making an already complex situation even more so. By 1947, the division of Germany becomes a reality. The so-called Truman Doctrine is proclaimed as President Harry Truman seeks to prevent the spread of communism in Europe by any means. This is a clear challenge to communism and the Soviet Union, which, as you can imagine, Stalin didn't take kindly to, and there would be no agreement between Western powers and the Soviet Union. The West now feared that the Soviet Union would steal a united Germany. So what options remained? Exactly, a divided Germany. The Marshall Plan provided a further divide between East and West and became the concrete application of the Truman Doctrine. This was the brainchild of U.S. Secretary of State George Marshall and was announced in June 1947. All European countries were asked to help pay to rebuild Europe, even the Soviet Union, though the offer was declined. Back to Germany. By 1948, the Soviet Union had had enough and left the Allied Control Council. The situation escalated further in June when the Western Allies initiated a currency reform of their zones of occupation without consulting the Soviet Union. Hello Deutschmark. In Soviet eyes, this went against the Potsdam agreements, according to which Germany should remain a political and economic entity. The Soviets responded by blocking off West Berlin between June 1948 and May 1949. In April 1949, the American and British occupation zone joined the French one and became a tri-zone, and on May 23, 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany was established. The founding of the Russian-controlled German Democratic Republic, the GDR, followed on October 7th, and a division of Germany was official. The Iron Curtain had now completely fallen. So to sum up once again, there was never actually any agreement between the USA, Great Britain, and Russia over how to deal with Germany, and it was clear that sooner or later, this would only complicate the situation. But the fact that Germany and Berlin remained divided for so long Few would have expected that a full 40 years later, in 1989, the Iron Curtain fell. One of the parts of the Cold War that we often leave out, especially because our relations with them has changed significantly over the years, primarily due to the efforts of, of all people, Richard Nixon, of course, is China. And so as we are escalating our Cold War with the Soviet Unions, we now get a second enemy. Again, had been our ally in World War II, uh, but they had, and had a civil war. The Communist Party won. Now we have a communist, uh, uh, a second communist country, a large country, the one that is, it has the largest population on the planet, and one that has been, quote-unquote, civilized for about 4,000 years. And so... Um, this feeds into this fear of, uh, of communism in the, in the East. And so now we have Russia, which is a huge geographic area. We have China, which is a huge geographic area with a large population. Both of these um, being um, now under communist control. Mao Zedong, of course, uh, it becomes the, um, uh, the head of the Soviet state. Uh, I mean, not the Soviet state, the Chinese state. And... Um, Basically, we just roll China and Russia up into the Cold War, as and, and they're not even necessarily working together. They're not necessarily allies. Just because they have the same type of political system doesn't mean that they end up being political allies on everything. Uh, and in uh, 1950, the um, we had a National Council, a Nas National Security Council report uh, 
68. This was a top security, top secret policy paper that basically said that that our policy for the Cold War would be to contain communism uh, at all costs, whether it was in China or in uh, the Soviet Union. Now, uh, many people have claimed victory because the Soviet Union did collapse. Really, the Russian state didn't change that much. Um, some private ownership was kicked in after the collapse, but uh, the, it was a totalitarian state before. It's a totalitarian state now. The same with China. It was a totalitarian Chinese uh, state before. Both China and Russia have just recently extended the, the terms of their presidents uh, essentially for lifetime. Um, of course, Donald Trump, when he, as, as president, has, it joked about uh, maybe we ought to try that sometime. We shall see. Um, and when the Soviet Union collapses, though, in the 80s, and hopefully we'll get to this before the end of the semester, uh, essentially that leaves just one major power, which was the United States. And we've rested on those laurels, which is why the uh, China is really important to watch right now. Because uh, you know, during the, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, for example, they built a 500-bed hospital in a week. They literally, and it was fully functional from the from the time they broke ground until the first patient moved in was less than eight. It was eight days. Um, uh, we, while they built that hospital and started having places for people to uh, uh, recuperate from the disease, we were still arguing whether or not it, it it was contagious or whether or not people under 65 could get it or whether or not it was really an emergency. Um, it's a it will be interesting to see because over the next 20 years, China will become, if it takes that long, the dominant and predominant economic force on the planet. And the United States will, will be a second-class state once again. We knew how to do things. We have forgotten. Um, most of what was set up with NATO uh, is, is been being dismantled since uh, 19, uh, since 2016. Um, our relationship with our NATO allies is is uh, diminishing. Our relationship with people like Russia is rather weird. So we'll we'll see how this all all comes down. Uh, this was originally a secret memoranda. Uh, it was eventually made public. It was declassified in 1975, and and I mean, it wasn't. It it might have been a secret on paper, but everyone knew that our primary concern, all of the wars we got into, Vietnam, Korea, all of this was to prevent the spread of the international communist threat. What began as an ideological struggle within a former colony in East Asia soon became a proxy war for the superpowers with millions of casualties. For several years, the Cold War became hot and many of the certainties of the previous decades disappeared. In political as well as military terms, the world would never be the same again. And the effects of this conflict are still very much felt to this day. Let's have a look at the Korean War. I'm Indy. Welcome to a new season of Battlefields. The Korean Peninsula, despite always having had its own distinct culture from both China and Japan, had repeatedly been the site of conflicts and in the age of imperialism became a political football for its larger neighbors. This had culminated in an occupation by the Empire of Japan from 1910 to the end of the Second World War. After the Japanese surrender, Korea was divided, much like Germany, into zones of occupation between the Allied powers. The North was administered by the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin, the South controlled by the United States. The border between the two regions was defined, somewhat arbitrarily, as the 38th parallel, giving control of the capital Seoul and the major port of Busan to the Americans. Now, as the relationships between the superpowers froze during the latter half of the 1940s with the descending of the Iron Curtain, so did two Koreas emerge, a communist north under Kim Il-sung and a capitalist south under Syng Man Rhee. At the time, neither regime was exactly what you'd call democratic, with the army in the south brutally suppressing any left-wing protests and conducting mass executions against suspected communist sympathizers. Although both sides sought control over the entire peninsula, the political divide made this increasingly unlikely via peaceful means. With both Americans and Russians withdrawing by 1949, 
the stage was set for war. Hostilities broke out June 25, 1950. In a well-coordinated surprise attack, North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel, quickly routing their under-trained, under-equipped, and outnumbered South Korean counterparts. The small number of American troops still present also found themselves overwhelmed and unprepared. Thousands of Korean civilians and soldiers fled south ahead of the advancing Northern Army, and Seoul fell on the 29th. The United Nations Security Council condemned North Korea's invasion, and on the 27th, it passed a resolution calling for military assistance for South Korea. A coalition of 17 nations, headed by the United States, was dispatched to join the war on the side of the South. The present situation is a serious one and is a threat to international peace. I consider it the clear duty of the Security Council to take steps necessary to re-establish peace in that area. Now, the USSR was not present for these meetings. She was boycotting the Security Council because of a dispute over who should represent China. And after Russia rejoined the Security Council that August, it was too late to veto the decision. It would take a while, though, for the UN troops to arrive. In the meantime, in the weeks following the invasion, the U.S. and South Korean forces found themselves pushed down towards the far south of the country, finally mounting a stand and establishing a line of defense near the port of Busan in August. On September 15, 1950, U.N. forces under the command of Douglas MacArthur executed a masterful amphibious invasion at Incheon, where they were able to establish a bridgehead. The northern forces, overstretched and demoralized, disintegrated. Two weeks later, Seoul and the rest of the South were under UN control. The UN command's objectives had been achieved, but US President Harry Truman authorized the pursuit of North Korean troops beyond the 38th parallel, with American and South Korean soldiers entering Pyongyang on the 19th of October. Within a few days, they had pushed North Korean forces almost all the way to the border with China. Now, China had already announced her intention to intervene on the communist side back in August. With the Americans approaching the Yalu River, the Chinese finally launched their counterattack on October 25th. After decisive but costly victory at the Changchun River at the end of November, they were able to drive the UN forces out of the north. A courageous rearguard action by the Turkish contingent meant that most UN troops were able to successfully retreat south past the 38th parallel. With Kim Il-sung removed from chief command, the Chinese were the main fighting force on the communist side. They pressed forward during the early months of 1951, recapturing Seoul on January 7th, but their exhausted troops would soon lose momentum. By April, the UN had recaptured the capital again. That same month, the charismatic but controversial General MacArthur, who had pursued an aggressive strategy, repeatedly challenged presidential authority and even considered launching nuclear weapons was relieved of his duty. The Chinese spring offensive of April and May achieved little, despite covert support from Soviet MiG-15 jet fighters. And by the middle of the year, after inconclusive but costly fighting, the front line had settled back to the area around the 38th parallel. For the next two years, the war would be a bloody stalemate, with heavy losses, especially among the poorly equipped Chinese, as extended peace talks dragged on. Ultimately, after the death of Stalin in Russia and the election of President Eisenhower in the United States, an agreement was reached and an armistice signed on July 27, 1953. The front line became a demilitarized zone, a four-kilometer-wide buffer zone patrolled by North Korean, South Korean, United States, and UN troops. It remains the most heavily fortified national border to this day. Now, as the agreement was only an armistice between armed forces and not a treaty between governments, the Korean War has still not officially ended as of 2015. South Korea would remain a poor and largely undemocratic country until a major economic boom in the 1970s and the June Democratic Uprising in 1987. North Korea remains an almost completely isolated authoritarian state with unparalleled levels of political repression and human rights abuses. While its GDP had been similar to that of the South until 1970, it is now at a level of 2.5% in comparison. The Korean War is often called 
the Forgotten War. In the American psyche, it's overshadowed by the Second World War before it and the Vietnam War after it. In Europe, and much of Asia as well, many simply know it as the war that split North and South Korea. Nevertheless, the conflict was important in a number of ways, both in political and military terms. In political terms, it was the first and only time the American and Soviet armed forces would ever face each other in military combat. It was also the first time that the newly formed United Nations intervened in a conflict with military force, successfully fending off the invasion of one country by another. In contrast to the League of Nations before it, the UN was keen to demonstrate that it had teeth and wanted to avoid the appeasement strategy that had preceded World War II. The experience of the United States, after both the communist victory in the Chinese Civil War and the stalemate in Korea, strengthened their concept of domino theory, which was a deciding factor in the intervention in Vietnam during the 1960s. However, by treating communism as a monolithic red menace, the American government was ignoring the way more complicated and nuanced realities of the individual movements in question, which often emerged in a post-colonial context. In military terms, the Korean War saw a number of important changes from World War II. Although jet fighters had been used to a limited extent during the final years of World War II, the Korean War saw them play a central role. Also, this was the first time that helicopters were used extensively. They had several duties, but the main one was to ferry wounded soldiers from the front line to army hospitals. The Korean War was brought back to the public consciousness in the West with the movie and subsequent TV series MASH, based on the experiences of a U.S. Army surgeon. Fiction aside, improved medical support gave forces on the UN side an unprecedented recovery rate. If a wounded American soldier could make it to a mobile army surgical hospital, MASH unit, he stood a 97% chance of survival. So what do you think? Why do you think the Korean War never had the same cultural impact as Vietnam or the Second World War? Was it the fact that it ended in a draw, or that horrific massacres and war crimes were committed by both sides? Did that mean that it didn't have the same good guys versus bad guys glamour of World War II? One of the real first tests for this new world order, this first world versus the second world with the third world, those countries that are not aligned with either the first or the second, kind of being where we play this out, um, really happens in Korea. At the end of World War II, in the negotiations of how the world is going to look after that war, uh, Korea was split in half. North Korea and South Korea. North Korea, they both had democratic elections. North Korea uh, put in a, a communist country, a communist government. Uh, uh, South Korea put in a democratic government. And very shortly after, uh, after that, uh, North Korea invades South Korea. That, again, triggers treaties we then end up going the it, it, and, and the un we drag the un into this this is the first time that there is such a thing as a un peacekeeping force this is the period in our, our history where um we don't go to war as the u.s we go to the war with our allies and, and we go to fight so even in iraq and iran or, or iraq and, and iran afghanistan um we've been with quote-unquote coalition forces we've gone in with other countries to to fight the majority of the fighting is done by americans the majority of the cost is is, is borne by americans um but that's uh, really what what uh, is triggered at this particular point this is the first time that the united nations actually authorizes um the military action under their their auspices um once we kick in, um, China then throws their lot, even though they're part of the UN, they throw their lot uh, behind the North Koreans, and we end up in a uh, essentially a, a stalemate where we have, um, on one side we have China and North Korea, and on the other side we have the United States and their allies and uh, South Korea. Um, massive death toll. Uh, we end up with a ceasefire, an armistice, which is where we still are. Uh, that war is still hot. It is still a police action that has never been terminated. There is an armed border between them. There is a demilitarized zone uh, that, 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 that doesn't have any uh, uh, fighting going on with with forces then on either side of that 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 basically have missiles and and guns and cannon and 
uh, artillery all aimed at the major cities in North and South Korea. So if that were to break out, it would break out into a, a full-blown war, um, essentially overnight if it, if, if it were to happen again. I apologize for this image being a little bit fuzzy, but it's, it's crucial to explain the, the, the way I want to kind of wrap up this Cold War talk. Dwight Eisenhower had been the um, uh, Allied commander, the, the supreme Allied commander in World War II in, in the European theater. And he really understood um, the role the military plays in the overall scope of America. And he, in his, in his farewell address, in his final speech as president, he warned the country to beware of what he called the Congressional Military Industrial Complex. Now, we always refer to this as the Military Industrial Complex, and that's deliberate. Um, the, the word Congressional was taken off of it, mostly by Congress people, because it takes out their complicity. And it also means that it doesn't make sense. We talk about, oh, the military-industrial complex. Military spends a lot of money. Industry makes a lot of money off of building material for that. And so we, we, there is a, a certain level of reciprocity between big business and the military. There's a, a business relationship there. And as the military, which is the number one consumer of most things, the number one purchaser of fuel, of gasoline in the United States, is the U.S. military. It's not the rest of us. It's just the military. They have massive reserves that, that, that they keep and they, may, they, they, they purchase tons of stuff. Lots of stuff. And that's okay um, if we need it. And, 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 and that means that there are jobs for people making those goods and then there's jobs in the military for people that are using those goods. So, I mean, it, 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 that part by itself, the industrial, the military industrial complex, it, it doesn't seem like it's all that bad. That's not what Eisenhower was warning about. What he was warning about was the Congressional Military Industrial Complex. And that's why I want all three words here. And this is how it works. We've got to go all the way back to the Constitution. And the Constitution sets up two of a bicameral, a two-house um, uh, legislature at the national level. The one house represents land. So every state, regardless of its population, has two senators. So North Dakota, which has a population smaller than the city of Fresno, has two senators. California, which has a population the size of, of Canada, has two senators. Right? It, it has nothing to do with the population. It is simply to do with land. And so people that live in lower density, uh, lower population density areas, actually have more power in the U.S. Senate than people that live in big "Quote unquote powerful states like New York and California, which have um, the, the, the are the two most populous states in in the country. Uh, again, they only have two senators. The other half of of the uh, uh, Congress is the House of Representatives, and there it's based on population. And it, there's still some inequality. For example, you know, the city of Fresno has two depending on where you want to draw the lines, Fresno County, Fresno and Tulare County, the, the, the general area has probably four members of the House of Representatives that represent just this core area of Fresno and the immediate surrounding area. North Dakota has one. But again, our population exceeds theirs by a, a significant number. So they still have uh, 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 a slightly imbalance, but it's closer. They have a low population. They have one member of the House of Representatives. We have a high population. We have... I think 56 or, or, or 70 some odd members of the House of Representatives here in California, just because our population is much larger. Now, all of this is to explain what Eisenhower was, uh, uh, was warning against. And let me explain how it works. So, my job as a member of the House of Representatives, where I'm up for election every two years, is I pretty much, the moment I'm elected, I'm going to spend the rest of my time worrying about my next election. And this is one of the biggest problems with American politics, is that the moment someone's elected, they begin their re-election campaign. They don't begin governing, they begin their re-election campaign. And so, the one of the ways that people try to get re-elected is that they illustrate that they demonstrate that they have um, served their constituents well. 
And you do that by creating jobs, right? Get a military base into your district. That means that there's going to be the military there. That's going to create jobs in the mini markets and the home market and the uh, uh, gas stations and the liquor stores and everything in that, in that surrounding area are going to benefit for the fact that there's new population moving in. Another way that you can, can create jobs is to bring federal contracts to your district. So it might be that there's a, a contract to produce ventilators or something like that, and there's a factory in your area that can do that. You push and you push and push, and you get that contract in your area. That increases jobs. That increases economic activity in that area. And it's beneficial. And so when you come up for re-election, you can say, look, I've created... 200,000 jobs in my area uh, over the last five years, and uh, our, our standard of living has gone up X, right? And that makes sense. I mean, if you're going if, if, if to have to run for election, then do good stuff to get reelected. That makes perfect sense. What doesn't make perfect sense is that the industrial part of the congressional military industrial complex has realized that, uh, it, the, that the best way to um, uh, fulfill the contracts, which is of the greatest benefit to the Congress people, not Congress as a whole, not the American people, but to individual Congress people, is to, f is to divvy up the, uh, the contracts. And so different parts of different military systems are built all across the country. And that ensures that um, those Congress people have something they can take to their constituents and say, look, I brought you this factory that builds the widget that goes into this weapon. Um, but it also means that uh, it's spread, it is so spread out that if a con contract were to get canceled, it would impact workers in dozens or hundreds of different localities. And so it is a way for the members of the House of Representatives to earn favor with their constituents. It is also a way in which the uh, industrial complex has managed to tie uh, uh, Congress into uh, really a hostage situation. Let me give you an example, and this will explain it pretty well. A few years ago, the Speaker of the House was a guy named John Boehner out of southern Ohio. Basically, Cincinnati was the area that he covered. Cincinnati, if you've ever been there, is an extremely poor, depressing city. Um, I, I lived in Ohio for a couple of years. Um, Cleveland, I really liked. There were, there were some places that were very depressing, very, very depressed. Um, and the economy was kind of mixed. Cincinnati was just depressing. You, 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 there was like there was a, always a gray cloud over the city no matter what. It was just a very depressing place to be. Um, partly because economically it is uh, not doing that well. Cleveland is much, much higher standard of living than, than in Cincinnati. And Cincinnati al almost feels like the South. It, 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 it's that different from, from Cleveland. Um, in uh, 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 Cincinnati was a factory that made the engines for a, uh, a jet that the military had ordered. The military uh, contacted Congress and said, you know what, we would like to cancel that order because we'd like to m use that money elsewhere. We don't need fighter jets. We're not doing conventional war where we're fighting, we're, you know, we're, doing, we're fighting against Islamic terrorists. We're not fighting against armed fighter jets. Right? A fighter jet does no good when you have nobody to fight against, right? It's a weapon that, that is redundant, essentially. And they felt they had more than sufficient uh, stock of uh, these types of fighter jets, and this particular contract should be canceled so that they could use those funds for other types of we weapons and supplies. Well, the problem was that um, when you, if you were going to cancel that, it was a, a multi-billion, each of these planes cost about a billion bucks, a uh, multi-billion dollar contract spread across the country. And so there was a lot of, of resistance to cancel the contracts. So think about this for a minute. The government, the, the military is telling the government, I don't want your airplane. I don't need your airplane. Save the money. Save the taxpayers' money 
from building this airplane that we can't use. And, and if you want to spend that money, there are other ways that we can spend it. And so it goes to Congress, and they struggle trying to pass the law that would cancel uh, this particular contract, because the they just can't cancel it, because it's appropriated. So they did finally get the contract for that airplane canceled, except for the contract for the engines, which were built in Cincinnati in John Boehner's district. Remember, he was the Speaker of the House. He was the one that could really control what was put on the floor to vote for. He managed to get the contract canceled as the military wanted, but managed to keep the part of the contract that kept people in his district employed. So they are making engines for an airplane that doesn't exist. They will deliver those to the military where they will be almost immediately either scrapped or just wrapped in plastic and put in a warehouse somewhere and they will sit there until at some point they will be scrapped for the for the metal. So this is is uh, what Eisenhower was uh, was trying to warn us against. We ignored the orders or, or I mean we ignored the warning and we now live in a situation where um, uh, sixty percent of every dollar you g give the federal government in taxes goes to the military, and a big way that it goes to the military is building systems, building military systems, building weapons that will never ever be used, that are just sitting being stockpiled someplace. And we can't leave the Cold War without talking about what it did to the American public here at home. Uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy, along with um, Richard Nixon, who was his right-hand man, uh, began looking for commies under every rock. Um, the it, it was a typical oligarchic, I mean, we see the same type of behavior now where people will, will, will bring up things. I have in my hand a list of 50 people who are guilty of doing such and so, and then when you ask to see the list, it doesn't actually exist. But uh, the, the demagoguery through lies and fear and intimidation um, were prevalent through much of, of the 50s and in, 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 yeah, get a little bit into the 60s. The fear of communism. This is one of the reasons why uh, politicians like Bernie Sanders, who calls himself a, a democratic socialist, he's really a social democrat, but that's okay, uh, but he calls himself a democratic socialist. That notion of socialism, communism, is so deeply ingrained in, in people of your, your uh, grandparents and even your parents' generation that uh, anything with those types of labels are, are almost impossible um, to, to try to get the, the, the public to even look at. But this was an extremely ugly part of our history. Human, uh, uh, most civil rights were just completely ignored and we basically were looking for, for traitors uh, in every cupboard, under every rock, in uh, everybody, everybody, everybody's bedroom. Um, it, it was one of our ugliest chapters. Imagine that one day you're summoned before a government panel. Even though you haven't committed any crime or been formally charged with one, you are repeatedly questioned about your political views, accused of disloyalty, and asked to incriminate your friends and associates. If you don't cooperate, you risk jail or losing your job. This is exactly what happened in the United States in the 1950s as part of a campaign to expose suspected communists. Named after its most notorious practitioner, the phenomenon known as McCarthyism destroyed thousands of lives and careers. For over a decade, American political leaders trampled democratic freedoms in the name of protecting them. During the 1930s and 1940s, there had been an active but small communist party in the United States. Its record was mixed. While it played crucial roles in wider progressive struggles for labor and civil rights, it also supported the Soviet Union. From the start, the American Communist Party faced attacks from conservatives and business leaders, as well as from liberals who criticized its ties to the oppressive Soviet regime. During World War II, when the USA and USSR were allied against Hitler, some American communists actually spied for the Russians. When the Cold War escalated and this espionage became known, domestic communism came to be seen as a threat to national security. 
But the attempt to eliminate that threat soon turned into the longest-lasting and most widespread episode of political repression in American history. Spurred on by a network of bureaucrats, politicians, journalists, and businessmen, the campaign wildly exaggerated the danger of communist subversion. The people behind it harassed anyone suspected of holding left-of-center political views or associating with those who did. If you hung modern art on your walls, had a multiracial social circle, or signed petitions against nuclear weapons, you might just have been a communist. Starting in the late 1940s, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover used the resources of his agency to hunt down such supposed communists and eliminate them from any position of influence within American society. And the narrow criteria that Hoover and his allies used to screen federal employees spread to the rest of the country. Soon, Hollywood studios, universities, car manufacturers, and thousands of other public and private employers were imposing the same political tests on the men and women who worked for them. Meanwhile, Congress conducted its own witch hunt, subpoenaing hundreds of people to testify before investigative bodies like the House Un-American Activities Committee. If they refused to cooperate, they could be jailed for contempt or, more commonly, fired and blacklisted. Ambitious politicians like Richard Nixon and Joseph McCarthy used such hearings as a partisan weapon, accusing Democrats of being soft on communism and deliberately losing China to the communist bloc. McCarthy, a Republican senator from Wisconsin, became notorious by flaunting ever-changing lists of alleged communists within the State Department. Egged on by other politicians, he continued to make outrageous accusations while distorting or fabricating evidence. Many citizens reviled McCarthy, while others praised him. And when the Korean War broke out, McCarthy seemed vindicated. Once he became chair of the Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations in 1953, McCarthy's recklessness increased. It was his investigation of the Army that finally turned public opinion against him and diminished his power. McCarthy's colleagues in the Senate censured him, and he died less than three years later, probably from alcoholism. McCarthyism ended as well. It had ruined hundreds if not thousands of lives and drastically narrowed the American political spectrum. Its damage to democratic institutions would be long-lasting. In all likelihood, there were both Democrats and Republicans who knew that the anti-communist purges were deeply unjust, but feared that directly opposing them would hurt their careers. Even the Supreme Court failed to stop the witch hunt, condoning serious violations of constitutional rights in the name of national security. Was domestic communism an actual threat to the American government? Perhaps, though a small one. But the reaction to it was so extreme that it caused far more damage than the threat itself. And if new demagogues appeared in uncertain times to attack unpopular minorities in the name of patriotism, could it all happen again? So that wraps up the 1950s lecture on the Cold War, but don't go away, or come back next time anyway, because there's a lot more to talk about the 50s, and we'll do that next time. Thanks for joining me. See you later.